Good morning and welcome to our Good Friday online meditation. Uh, my name is Barry, I'm the vicar here at Upton and the surrounding parishes and it's wonderful to be able to share this special day with you. As you can probably tell my voice is not what it is normally. Uh, I've had a throat infection all week so I apologise for that in advance and I hope that it won't spoil your enjoyment of our Good Friday online meditation too much. Over the next hour, we're going to read through the whole of Mark's account of Jesus' arrest, trial and crucifixion. And after each reading, uh, one of four different voices will bring you a short reflection, um, after which we'll have a few minutes of quiet to think about what's been said, or indeed on however else the Lord speaks to you through the reading. The whole service should take round about an hour. Uh, we'll sing a couple of hymns within that. We've got some prayers also. And so, as we gather at the foot of the cross, let's begin by praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And let's begin our time together by singing, There is a green hill far away. Mark chapter 14, beginning at the 32nd verse. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. 
When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have to come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you didn't arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, a while back we'd have a problem occasionally at home with our internet, uh, and I'm pretty sure it was caused by one of my children. As you can probably guess, with multiple kids at home needing to do homework every night, we have a bit of a computer room, three PCs all set up next to each other, all connected to an in-house computer network through something called a repeater. If that's too much IT jargon for you, I apologise. I promise you won't need to know anything more than that if the repeater is on, the computers can access the internet, and if the repeater is switched off, so is the internet. And the moment that happens, the kids start to scream and panic, Dad, the internet's broken! And I'd come into the room, and I'd kneel down on the ground next to the plug the repeater uses, and I'd find that it had been switched off at the wall yet again. So I'd switch it back on, the internet would come back on, the screaming would stop, and my little inquest would start. And of course we had many little inquests about who had turned off the router, but nobody ever admitted to it. Maybe that's why I'm a vicar rather than a detective. I've instructed the kids not to turn the plugs off though, but they all deny doing it. They've all disobeyed me in one way or another about this, assuming it isn't a ghost switching them off, and, or it might have been the field vole we found in the house last week, I suppose. But assuming it's not a ghost or a vole, then uh, one of the children is lying to their father. Because despite me telling them not to touch the switch, someone keeps switching off the repeater. Repeatedly, and then lying about it. Repeatedly. The idea of children disobeying their father is of course one of the Bible's big stories of human history. Uh, and of course it wasn't just our human fathers we disobey, it's our heavenly father too. You trace that story all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, to Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. Back in the garden people enjoyed an idyllic, perfect life, governed by only one amazingly generous rule. God said, well you can eat absolutely anything in the garden, so it's a rule all about freedom. And it has only one restriction on it, except the fruit from one particular tree. Uh, it seems a really tiny thing, doesn't it? Why was God denying them that one particular fruit? Well, I don't think it was anything inherent to the fruit. It was simply about their loyalty to God and their dignity as people. It was a way of inviting them to daily make a choice between, on the one hand, loyalty, unlimited blessing and everlasting life, and on the other, disloyalty, separation from God and death. What a choice. Blessing or curse. Relationship or isolation. Life or death. Well, which would you choose? It seems obvious, doesn't it? Which is why it took the tempter coming into the garden, lying to Eve about what God had said, to fool Adam and Eve into disobeying. And the moment they disobeyed, the consequences were, well, world-shattering. Ever since, everyone has disobeyed. And everyone has died. Satan holds sway whenever and wherever we are disobedient to the Father. That's why Jesus was so special. At his baptism, God said, You are my son in whom I am well pleased. And when the devil came to trick and deceive Jesus in that Lenten temptation, If you're the son of God, he says. He teases him about whether he truly is who God has told him he is. But unlike Adam and Eve, Jesus doesn't fall for the lie. He doesn't disobey his father. 
where we fail, he succeeds. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. He always obeyed his Father, even when faced with the temptation to save his life by fleeing. Did you notice that in our reading? Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, Jesus prayed. That's Jesus exploring the possibility of not going to the cross. The cup is a metaphor for God's anger at human disobedience. It's the punishment Jesus would suffer on the cross. And Jesus is saying, is there another way? Can I avoid this horror that I know is coming? But then he resolves, yet not what I will, but what you will. He chooses to obey his father. And he obeys his father all the way to death. And that obedience changed the world forever. You see, Jesus was the first of a new breed of human. Uh, if you like, he's a new Adam to replace the old Adam, a new beginning to fix the broken beginning. And the brilliant thing about this idea of a new Adam is that we can be part of that too. Rather than dying as a consequence of Adam's disobedience, we can live forever through Jesus' obedience. The Bible puts it like this, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. All because of the Son who obeyed the Father. We're going to have our first period of quiet now. Why don't you reflect on these questions? The reading is taken from Mark, chapter 14, verses 53 to 65. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, 
but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony about him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Yet even then, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? he asked. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, Prophesy! And the guards took him and beat him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, my thoughts on Mark chapter 14, 53 to 65. In the previous reading, we've just seen Jesus be arrested. Now he's taken for the Sanhedrin, a large and very powerful assembly of the high priest, chief priests, all the elders and the teachers of the law. They're all looking for evidence against Jesus so they can sentence him to death. Various false statements are made against Jesus, but those testimonials do not agree. The chief priest stands up. He's very irritated and angry with Jesus as Jesus will not answer those charges. Chief priest's behaviour is that of someone who's very frustrated. He's not been able to convict Jesus on any charge so far. But then the chief priest asks Jesus if he's the Messiah. Jesus then answers, yes, I am. This answer is enough for the chief priest, who then tears his clothes, saying, why do we need any more witnesses? You've heard his blasphemy. Mark then tells us all the assembly of the Sanhedrin then condemned Jesus as worthy of death. Some people then spat at poor innocent Jesus, blindfolded him and struck him with their fists. Some then shouted prophesy at him. The next indignity Jesus had to suffer was for the guards to take him away and beat him severely. Well, how then do we as Christians react to this very unjust trial and terrible series of punishments for Jesus? I think there could be three possible reactions. Firstly, we must ask ourselves how ready we are to brave slander, ridicule and humiliation for the sake of Jesus. As Christ our Saviour had to endure so much, ultimately even death on the cross, why should we be so wary of other people's adverse comments about us being Christians, his followers? And then secondly, as people there were so eager to shame Jesus, should we not now be much more eager to bring Jesus great honour? To be performing demanding tasks to bring glory to Jesus? And finally, should we not have more confidence in stating and knowing Jesus is our Lord, the source and provider of our personal redemption? We must be assured in knowing that Jesus, the Son of Man, has provided full and complete atonement for each and every one of our sins and transgressions. We must therefore wholeheartedly proclaim Jesus as our very own personal Saviour. There's also a view influenced by the TV programme Undercover Boss. Here a company director goes undercover in their organisation to see how a range of employees behave when they think no one important is watching, before later judging them for better or worse. It's rather like our reading from Mark's Gospel where Jesus is experiencing how those in power really did behave. Now, if Jesus were to reappear today undercover, 
I wonder how we judge our present church leaders. Also, what would he say about the ways we really behave? Perhaps this is a good time for us all to reevaluate ourselves and become more like someone that Jesus would be pleased to meet. It really is up to us to try our best to live in the world the way Jesus would want us to. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verses 66 to 72. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene, Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said and went out into the entrance. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them. This fellow is. After all, you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses and he swore to them. I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the cock crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the cock crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Now you've heard the saying, I think, curiosity killed the cat. The high priest's courtyard seems to have been the place to find out the news of what was going on with that Nazarene Jesus, as the servant girl described him. Peter was there, discreetly, not so visible now as he was when everything was so exciting and when people were flocking. The others standing there, perhaps part of those crowds, curious. The others 
Why would they not have seen Peter already? What was their motivation now to point out Peter to one another? You know, perhaps Peter thought he was in serious trouble once he had been found out. His denials rise to the surface and he storms off in tears, as the others would have seen him do. One can imagine them stood around looking at one another, wondering what all that was all about. They'd only asked. And if he was in serious trouble, would they not have pursued him or summoned the guard? Perhaps they were simply interested, curious. You knew this man. What did he say? What was he like? You see, it may not have been so bad for Peter to engage in conversation with the others around the fire. The authorities had got their man. We don't know how interested they were in arresting any of Jesus' followers. We think of them as very important, but I think that they were thought of as part of the rabble, and maybe a bit stupid, or even victims. No, if Peter had not been so emotional and unwilling to be associated with Jesus, he may have given some real insight for those people standing around. And who knows where that might have led. It could have been the right thing to do. It could have been too much of a risk. But perhaps it was just too soon for Peter. After the events of the night, and emotions were running high. Perhaps he was now dealing with a deep insight from his Lord about himself, and when this happens to us, we too can find ourselves in an emotional place, maybe shocked, unable at that point to steady our nerves or to describe everything, though maybe it's just too personal. Curiosity and the need for information, for any reason, could get the better of anyone. The one holding it all, but unable to speak about it, could be anyone. We see this around us today. I think this when reporters gather at the scene of an incident, trying to get information about what happened, who was there, were there any witnesses, and when they find someone, they draw them into an interview. But sometimes the witness is still in shock and too emotional to clearly express what happened or how they knew the victim. The scenario could happen to anyone. It could happen to us.
Our reading is taken from Mark, chapter 15, verses 1 to 20. Very early in the morning, the chief priests, the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole of the Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to get Pilate to release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head and with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. The idiom actions speak louder than words is used to emphasize that what you do is more important and shows your intentions and feelings more clearly than what you say. Early in the passage we read rather ominously that the chief priests and the whole of a Sanhedrin had made their plans. And in front of Pilate, they continue to accuse Jesus of many things. Even when asked by Pilate, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus replies simply, You have said so. Many accusations are made, and yet Jesus doesn't try to defend himself. Instead, he remains silent. Pilate is amazed, and I think intrigued by this enigmatic individual standing in front of him. He asks the crowd if he should release the king of the Jews. But the crowd, goaded on by the chief priests, demand that Barabbas be released. To satisfy the crowd, he releases Barabbas. 
And what should he do with the king of the Jews? Crucify him, they shouted. Actions speak louder than words. Hail, king of the Jews. A purple robe is placed on him and a crown of thorns placed ignominiously on his head. And yet this is not a normal coronation. Instead of praise and adulation, Jesus is violently and savagely beaten, mocked and spat on by the soldiers. He is then led away to be crucified. Actions speak louder than words. When we are accused of something, our first instinct is to defend ourselves. We have all watched those courtroom dramas where the defending barrister gives an eloquent and clever defence to prove their client's innocence and to make sure justice is done. It is easy to do justice, someone once said, but a lot harder to do right. Clearly from the text, neither justice or more importantly, right has been done. A miscarriage of justice has taken place and an innocent man is sent to his death. A death that will ultimately lead to life and our redemption. Paying in full our wages of sin. In the book of Isaiah we read, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Actions speak louder than words. Yet, although reticent in this passage, Jesus had already given his defence through his teaching and ministry. By preaching, but I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Actions speak louder than words. That's certainly true if you put your words into action. By going to a cross, Jesus lived out his words and remained faithful to his Father's will. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is indeed a very precious gift and something we should constantly praise and thank God for, embracing it every day for the rest of our lives.
Our final reading is taken from Mark chapter 15, beginning the 21st verse. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him amongst themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land, until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elisha. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Well, I love running Bible studies. Uh, and one of the things I love to do in a Bible study is hear people's questions, people's thoughts about the passage, things perhaps I had not seen there. Sometimes you can notice something you hadn't really noticed before. One time I was running a study on this passage and somebody asked a great question, which I'd never thought about. They said, those two rebels they crucified with Jesus in verse 27, one on his right and the other on his left. Uh, and here's the question, why were they on his right and his left? And I was a bit thrown by that. I mean, what's the answer? Have you ever wondered that question? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. And I hadn't. So I didn't really have an answer prepared for the question. But it looks like someone else has struggled with this as well. If you look closely at the text in your Bible, you will notice that there is a verse 27, and there's a verse 29, and verse 28 has been scrubbed out. It'll be there in the footnotes at the bottom of the page. And it looks as though somebody's tried to answer this question of why on the right and on the left. The footnote, for the, the verse 28, that, that seems to have been scrubbed out of the Bible, quotes an Old Testament prophet, Isaiah, chapter 53, talks about them being counted with the lawless ones. Why have they taken verse 28 out? Has someone changed the Bible? Well, yes, probably around the 5th century, somebody will have added verse 28 in, perhaps to try to explain a question that was answered in a Bible study about why were they on his right and on his left? I don't know. But as Christians and historians have uncovered more and more early manuscripts of Mark's Gospel, all dated to before the 5th century, what they've noticed is that verse 28 is missing in all of them. It doesn't exist. It wasn't in the early manuscripts, it only appears after the 5th century. Which means it almost certainly wasn't written by Mark. So most modern translations now miss verse 28 out and include it as a footnote. Which is all very interesting. But it doesn't actually answer our question of why the right and the left? Well, having thought about it a bit more, the best reason I can think of for Jesus being crucified with someone on his right and his left is that we're meant to remember the other time that phrase, left and right, crops up in the Jesus story. You see, back in Mark chapter 10, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to see Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. 
Can you drink the cup I'm, I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am to be baptized with? Now, when James and John came to Jesus to talk about glory, they're imagining Jesus is going to overthrow the Romans and rule as a king in Jerusalem. And they want to be his right hand and his left hand men. They want a seat at the top table, a piece of the action. And Jesus tells them, I'm afraid you've completely misunderstood what I'm about. You don't know what you're asking. They've understood nothing of what Jesus has been trying to teach them about his mission or what it means ultimately for Jesus to have God's glory. You see, for Jesus, his ultimate glory involves not the high table of authority, but the cross. That's what Jesus is referring to when he goes on about the cup he's about to drink and the baptism he's to be baptized with. That's the cross. And when we hear left and right in Mark chapter 15, I think we're meant to think back to James and John and realize that Although what's going on doesn't look very glorious as Jesus is being crucified, it's actually what Jesus had planned and wanted all along. For Jesus, this is his glory. The greatest, most glorious moment in his life is the cross. It's what he came to do. Yes, he preached. Yes, he healed. Yes, he cared. Yes, he rose from the grave. Yes, he'll return to judge the world. But... The cross is his ultimate glory, dying so that we might live. Just think about that for a moment. If you ask Jesus, what was the best moment of your life? When did you feel most alive, most purposeful, most useful? Well, his answer would be the moment he died on the cross, when he's dying for us, for me and for you. We'll never understand how much God loves us until we understand that the cross is Jesus' greatest glory.
if you'd like to talk about any of the issues that have been thrown up in the service today, or to explore more deeply the hope Jesus offers us at Easter, then do get in touch with me, Barry, at hopechurchfamily.org. So to finish, let's pray the traditional Good Friday Collect. Almighty God, we beseech thee graciously to behold this thy family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was contented to be betrayed and given up into the hands of wicked men, and to suffer death upon the cross, who now liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. <laughs> 